Good evening and welcome to this Prairie Lights virtual event. Um, I'm Karen with Prairie Lights and tonight we are excited to be partnering with the University of Iowa Press uh, for a special Pride Month event and we're thrilled to welcome Tom Rastrelli, author of Confessions of a Gay Priest, for a reading from his new book and a conversation with special guests Amanda Fletcher and M.G. Lord. Um, so I'll be turning the virtual floor over in just a moment, but I do just want to mention a few logistics. Uh, firstly, in case you're new to Zoom, you do have the ability to choose the way that the screen is viewed. If you hover your mouse in the top right corner, you'll see speaker view or gallery view. And if you click it to gallery view, you'll see all four, uh, you'll see all the boxes of the videos in your in your screen at once. Um, that's a good, I'd recommend that for sort of the discussion, uh, whereas maybe speaker view would be better for uh, when Tom is reading, you can kind of choose what works for you. Um, secondly, if, uh, if this event does fill um, and you know anyone who's trying to get in, we are also live on Facebook. So you can, uh, we've got some links on our website for directing to there as well. Um, and then lastly, at the end, we'll be opening things up for a Q&A following the discussion. So if you look at the bottom of your window, you'll see a little Q&A button. Um, as you have questions, you're welcome to type those into the Q&A chat box. And at the end, we'll take about 10 or 15 minutes to read some of those questions. Um, and so yeah, to start out, I'm excited to introduce Amanda Fletcher. Amanda Fletcher is the Penn America Emerging Voices Fellowship Manager, and she's also an alumna of the program. She hosts the Emerging Voices podcast, and she is a prolific travel and features writer. She has just finished her first memoir about a disastrous dive in which a girl gone wild goes horribly, horribly wrong. Please welcome Amanda. Hey, thanks, Karen. Can we make Karen jokes if it's necessary? Or are you, you can go over that already? <laughs> Karen jokes are fair game. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so yeah, even yeah. if I do say it, I don't really mean it. I'm just like playing off the zeitgeist. Totally, it's exactly. It's been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, our actor, Tom, has told me I need to stare directly into the camera so that it looks like I'm talking to all of you. So I'm gonna do my best, but I'm gonna, um, uh, kind of age myself right now, but this is very much like, does anyone remember Romper Room? MG, do you remember Romper Room? Where, um, they, where the, they looked into the mirror and they were saying the kids' names in the audience? My very Catholic parents deterred me from watching television. Okay, well then, no Romper Room. <laughs> but if anybody remembers that, how the lady from Romper Room would call out people's names, like Wendy and Orly and whoever else is in the audience. Karen. Karen, exactly. So anyway, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, you are so appreci appreciated. As you can see, I've redesigned my room, organized my bookcase in a rainbow for pride. Uh, June is a big month for Tom and his book and peripherally me because this is the 10th anniversary of our fateful meeting at Skidmore Summer Writers Institute. So uh, for all of you non-writers out there, uh, Writing residencies are basically like summer camp for writers. Um, you eat, sleep, read, workshop together. Uh, you go to evening events where you drink cheap wine and you eat pretzels and um, you get drunk and potentially sleep. Oh, Tom's here. Potentially sleep with someone <laughs> that maybe you shouldn't. Um, not that that's ever happened to me, but I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't have liked it. Um, but it's basically people that you wouldn't normally meet. So if you've gone to summer camp, you meet the kids from like all over the country or all over the state and you, you get to know them. Um, so summer of 2010, I was there for a month because I had no job and I was married to a banker and made it possible. Uh, and for the first two weeks, I, I had class with Philip Lopate and I would say his loyal band of Upper East Siders. And if any of them are watching this event, um, I'm like, can I say that? Because they're all therapists and doctors, teachers and professors, respectable women who I thought they would never like my work um, or didn't understand what I had to contribute, which was mainly meth, like methamphetamine and glittery red nipple covers. But they did, and Philip did, and I thought, hey, you know, maybe I can do this writing thing. But then the, the end of the two weeks came and I had to transition to like the whole new, like campers, the whole new round of campers. 
So then I had to like kind of figure out like how to find my way with that new round of, of campers. And I can remember sitting in the cafeteria and just kind of like riding on that high of like being away from home and you don't have to worry about anything. And like you, you have a room and you have food and like everybody has to kind of be nice to you. And, and I thought, you know, like the, I could do this. Like I could live like this cloistered away somewhere, living in a dorm, contemplating my existence. And I wouldn't have to worry about adulting because I was not very good at it. And I literally thought, maybe I could be a nun. And I remember having that thought. And then, you know, no it's my, I totally have that thought. It's totally my story. And, uh, you know, I, as I remember it, there's this moment where like the cafeteria doors swing open and the new crop of writers come in. And at the head of the new crop of writers are like, the prom king and queen from USC. And it's Tom Rastrelli and Orly Minazad arm in arm. And Orly's wearing this like red dress with the flowing hair. And like Tom looks like the captain of the football team. And they're laughing in a way that looks very much like a television couple. And I was like, oh my God, these two are so cool. Like I'm gonna have to be friends with them. I have to figure out how to make them like me. And, and it's kind of like that, right? Because then you go into class and then you read each other's work and, and you realize that you have these connections because of the things that you're writing about. And, you know, Orly was writing about, um, the story that Orly had was like, being in Planned Parenthood and contemplating like assimilation and birth control over like episodes of Maury Povich. And, um, you know, Tom was writing about dicks. And I'm just gonna say there was a lot of sex happening in Tom's piece. And I don't think it has changed very much. <laughs> that maybe the elements of the sex has moved around a little bit, but I think that, that Originally, I thought an ex-priest, like, who, what am I going to have in common with an ex-priest with my meth and my glittery pasties? And I realized that in, within the work, like, there's this, this vulnerability and this, this mistaking sex for love and this, this like, uh, fight between sex and love and violence and not understanding, like, what that means and this search for meaning. And, and what I came to understand was, you know, at least the three of us, you know, we had this thing in common that this search for belonging, this search for understanding that kind of tied us together. And it was helpful that we all three lived in California. So we were able to carry on that relationship um, outside of the workshop. But what, like, well, I'll have to ask you this, Tom, like you can talk, you can tell me now if you want, but like, remembering what people were writing. Like, I remember we had the jejun guy, like where we were like, what the hell? Like it was like, everything was jejun after he used that word. Because I remember me and Orly looking at each other like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> and, and, you know, this, this whole, we also had someone in there that was like writing a piece about the Lord God bird. Do you remember the Lord God bird essay? Yeah, it was, it was, there were some really good pieces though. Yeah, the, there was like really good pieces. There was somebody who was going to be a nun that was in our class too. So, I mean, it was the least. So, I mean, it was it's all over the place, right? Good. Yeah. And, and like we would go from, like I was going to say, so well, let's do the, let's jump off the Lord Godbird because I want to use that to segue MG Lord, the Lord That's Godbird, MG Lord. <laughs> M.G. Lord, a.k.a. Mary Grace Lord, is not unfamiliar, unfamiliar with Catholicism. Hence, she leapt to work with Tom on this book when he was her student at USC. She is the author of, among other books, take a breath, Forever Barbie, the unauthorized biography of a real doll, and the Accidental Feminist, How Elizabeth Taylor Raised Our Consciousness and We Were Too Distracted by Her Beauty to Notice. So MG's gonna be in conversation with Tom. So let's say hi to MG. Hi, hi MG. MG. Um, but, what I, but I kind of, what I wanted to, to say about, you know, writing workshops and like, we create these really strange like affinity groups, right? And it's like, we realize that we have so much in common um, thematically with people that we would never have thought we have things in common with. 
And I think that one of the things that I feel so blessed by being in creative, right, creative nonfiction and uh, memoir groups is that I tend to believe people when they tell me their experience. And I think that as we go forward, like in society and like today, <laughs> I think that's so important. Like you don't need to show me stats and you don't, I don't need to understand why that's your experience for me to believe in your experience. And I think that, that that's something that we really need to take into consideration when we're reading this book. I think that there, there will potentially be, and I have seen it in comments from, you know, uh, from pieces that, that have been published and from you sharing emails with me. It's like, there's going to be a lot of opposition to the things that you're saying. And, and I think that just to keep in mind that like, this is your experience, this happened, you were there. And there's a reason that there's so many dicks in this story because it's, it's relevant. Why are there so many dicks in the seminary? Why is everybody whipping their dick out? Well, there are no women. So there's, I mean, there's gonna be dicks if there are no women. Imagine. Right, exactly. <laughs> and human beings are sexual creatures that, that are looking for a uh, connection. Yeah. <laughs> so, just that's what I want you to keep in mind. Believe people's experience, a lot of dicks. And uh, I promise to be the one to say dicks a lot because MG didn't want to. But I might say preopic formation or obelisk or something along those lines. And she um, seems like she's looking for something. I'm just going to throw in dicks. Right. I'm sure that's what... Um, a lot, of, a lot of older ones, too. Very old. That, that stout old priest... Dick. Yes. Actually, we should, I'm going, I, uh, I guess I'll just plunge right in. I mean, you know, wait, wait, it's wait, interesting. Let me read the bio, Tom's bio. <laughs> All right. Introduce me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Tom I have to, Amanda, when I, you know, f after five minutes of talking with Tom at USC before he even joined our master's program, I didn't think prom king. I thought, if you will forgive me, prom queen. Oh my God, I love it. Yeah, I think you just have to start talking, and that's what I thought also. But there was like, Orly did all the talking, I think. In your couple, Orly did all the talking. You guys, MG just made Bruce laugh out loud. I could hear him <laughs> laughing in the other room. <laughs> all right, Tom, let me read your yeah. bio. You can, you can uh, read a piece of the book for us. So Tom Mayhill Rostrelli was born and raised in Clinton, Iowa. He got his Master of Professional Writing from USC and he's been a singer, actor, janitor, restaurant service professional, research assistant, reporter, and he's currently director of digital communi communications at Willamette University. No, Willamette. Willamette. Damn it, remember? I know you put it in there, but then I took it out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Willamette, damn it. He was ordained a priest on June 22nd, 2002. Ooh, ooh. He left the priesthood and came out of the closet for good on May 23rd, 2004, Tommy. Are you gonna read a little something for us? I am, and um, just thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, a special thanks to uh, Prairie Lights Books in Iowa City. Please support them, support your local bookstores, and um, thank you to University of Iowa Press. Thank you, both of you, for being here with me. Um, yeah, let's get this thing started. So the reading. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of the book because it is my 18th anniversary of being ordained a Catholic priest. And this is not, as you can tell if you've read the book, not an anniversary I ever really celebrate. So we're going to make it something big, something new tonight, and it's going to be the birth of this book. So I'm going to read you the prologue for starters here. So thank you. <clears throat> A procession of 100 men adorned in ankle-length white elves snaked through the rectory's rooms of antique furniture. Priests, deacons, and acolytes bantered about vacation plans and sexual abuse headlines. The stale scent of dry cleaning permeated the air. A few priests gave me thumbs up. Others nodded solemnly. Just behind me at the end of the line, the archbishop stood. His mitre, an upside down fang shaped hat that climbed to a point 15 inches above his forehead, lent him imposing height. His knuckles were wrapped around his crozier, a six and a half foot golden staff topped with a nautilus shell swirl, the symbol of his office as shepherd of the people. 
In ancient times, shep shepherds used their staffs to protect wayward sheep by compassionately breaking their legs. In the coming two and a half hour ceremony, this shepherd would ordain me a priest. I excused myself to the bathroom and looked in the mirror. The man staring back at me seemed a stranger. Silver, silvery blue eyes behind rimless oval frames, cropped brown hair gelled into a side part, angular cheeks and a dimpled chin. A few church ladies claimed that I looked like Christopher Reeve, Father Clark Kent, Reverend Superman. No pressure. You can do this, I said to myself. God, come to my assistance, and Lord, make haste to help me. I recited the opening line of the Liturgy of the Hours, the prayer that priests promised to, to pray multiple times a day. I put on a smile, straightened my, diaca, my, straightened my diagonal deacon stole, which ran from shoulder to hip. I looked like a newly crowned beauty queen. An explosion rocked the building. The lights and air conditioning died. I rushed to the window, worried about my family and friends gathered in the cathedral. Over its roof, purple smoke swirled before treetops into cobalt sky. I hurried back to my place in line with my two classmates. What exploded, I said. I thought it was your irritable bowel syndrome, the younger one said. Hey, the older one said, you won't joke about that when you're my age. He was in his 30s. I was 28. We were about to become three of the youngest priests in Iowa. The master of ceremonies announced that a squirrel met its demise at the intersection of a power wire and the cathedral's junction box. A priest with a rusty stain around his neckline said, that's what happens to those who bridge the gap between heaven and earth. His stole hung in parallel lines like a choir boys. He snapped his dentures, prepare to be zapped boys. No humans were injured. A severed power line had lashed a car, striping it like Christ's back. The ordination would continue, but without electricity. We quipped about God's pretentious sense of humor. As I followed the procession through the rectory's front door, the mid-June humidity engulfed me like a fever-drenched blanket. From the top of the stoop, I looked eastward over the oldest neighborhood in Dubuque. Beyond the rooftops, the brown waters of the Mississippi flowed south toward my hometown, my history. That was then. This is now, I thought. I followed the white-robed procession toward the towering cathedral named after St. Raphael, whose name means God's remedy. The building's brick-red nave supported ble a bleached white facade. A stained glass lancet window rose into a single square steeple topped with four marble trefoil crosses. Facing east, west, north, and south, the crosses reminded me of the mission I shared with the men walking with me, take God's healing love to the world. Seminary and acolytes added incense to their dangling golden thuribles. A sweet spiciness replaced the burnt rubber and ozone scent of the electrical explosion. The master of ceremonies trotted past, shouting last second orders, open your worship aids, maintain your spacing, don't rush the procession. I stepped into the cathedral. The pipe organ sound crashed against my chest. I strode down the stained glass lit aisle flanked by my classmates. The remains of the squirrel still smoldered in the parking lot. An hour later, I knelt at the foot of the altar with my hands folded and eyes closed. My kneecaps ground into the thin carpeting. An endless succession of priests filed past, pressing their hands on my bowed head. As they compressed my vertebrae, spat spasms shot down my spine and legs. I willed myself not to collapse. Sung Latin phrases echoed through the packed cathedral. My back twinged. No one had warned me that the rite was agonizing. After the pressing stopped, I opened my eyes. 100 priests with folded hands stood before the braided spires of the sanctuary screen. Some smiled, others had the constipated gaze of piety. Under my sweaty elb, I shifted from knee to knee, trying to relieve my burning thighs without drawing attention. I closed my eyes and listened to the archbishop's frantic vibrato intoning the prayer of consecration. In this moment, the Holy Spirit would transform me into something new. The church needed something new. In January, the Boston Globe had exposed Cardinal Bernard Francis Law for covering up the sexual abuse of minors by priests. 
As the months before my ordination passed, a mounting number of bishops fell in shame. I doubted my calling. But the church was different in Dubuque. My archbishop hadn't harbored pedophiles. He'd turned them over to the police. He'd offered their victims support and healing. I would do the same. After the archbishop completed the prayer, a priest lifted the deacon's stole from my shoulder and replaced it with a priest's stole. Over my head, he lowered a chasuble with gold and blue embroidery matching the archbishop's. I crossed from the center of the sanctuary to the, to the cathedral, the ornately carved oak throne where the archbishop sat. I knelt before him. From a crystal pitcher, he poured syrupy chrism, holy water, or sorry, holy oil scented with balsam over my upturned hand. Pressing his palms against mine, the archbishop smeared large crosses as he prayed the Father anointed our Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. May Jesus preserve you to sanctify the Christian people and to offer sacrifice to God. He folded his glistening hands around mine. His dark eyes were absolution. I would sacrifice myself for him, for God. Hands dripping with chrism, I stood, turned and walked to my spot at the foot of the altar I glanced to the front row, into my parents' eyes. They were crying, grinning. I smiled through prayers. I was a priest. Less than two years later, I turned my back on the archbishop. This time I held my tears. I rushed from his office into February's darkness. The frigid night air burned my cheeks. In the corner of the icy parking lot, my black pickup offered refuge. My only private space, it was where I retreated to sing, talk on my phone, and cry all the things a young priest doesn't want his pastor or cleaning lady to witness. I drove through blocks of Catholic neighborhoods, people who trusted the archbishop. Now, I had to obey his command by covering up sexual abuse. Skirting the line of bluffs that edged the river flats, I approached the cathedral. I recalled the squirrel electrocuted minutes before my ordination. Who had buried it or mourned its passing? Illuminated by spotlights, the cathedral's facade sprouted from the night, an omnipresent watchman in the darkness. I passed like a blowing cinder. On the north end of town, a boat ramp would provide easy access to the frozen Mississippi. My plan? Drive until the ice buckled under the weight of the truck. That's the prologue. That's uh, very upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a funny book too. It's not just all serious. Well, I actually, I mean, to me, this, this recalls our, our very first day in a writing workshop. Um, when I believe that this was the first piece you submitted and it was very different from this finished version because the uh, ordination screen, st the ordination scene was written from the point of view of the immolated squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, yes, the first round. I'm wondering how different it would have been if, you know, if, if Rocky, not Bullwinkle, had, had told the story. Um, but, I mean, actually, cutting to the chase, uh, cutting to the chase, Tom, why, uh, can you talk about why you wanted to be a priest? Yeah. Um, then we can talk about um, um, Amanda. Um, Sticks. Thank you. Sticks, sticks, sticks. Thank you. But yeah. priest, Tom, why? I mean, because there is an element of, you know, there is an element of Thomas Merton and St. Augustine in this story um, until it goes radically off the rails. Or maybe their stories were off the rails and they just never told them. But yeah, discuss well, this. It, it, I, I, obviously, in the book, if, as people read it, they will get all the nuances of this. But I mean, it's a com complex decision to become a priest. But I mean, it basically came down to, I wanted to help people. I wanted to do good. And I had been so focused on acting and on the theater. And, you know, I got to this, this age and I had all these questions. I had not been going to church. I was angry at the church for not ordaining women, for killing people in the crusades, for um, 
all sorts of things. And the sexual abuse that had been going on in the church in the 80s that was getting exposed as well. And um, as a victim of sexual abuse from when I was a teenager as well, I had all this anger about all that stuff. So I'd stopped going to church. But then I had this like, the theater just, I was getting depressed. It wasn't going well. And I had this change in my life where I felt like I needed to learn about the Catholic Church in order to understand so that I could leave for good. So I could say, yeah, I figured it out. It is all BS and I'm gonna leave. And so I was drawn, I'm a truth seeker. I was drawn into trying to understand the truth and I love helping people. And I just became fascinated with the theology and the philosophy and the preaching and the music and the scripture and the helping the people. And I really wanted to just help people and make the world a better place. And that was the world I was raised in. And it, it seemed like that was my calling then. And yet, I mean, you encountered, um, well, priest after priest who were kind of creepy, sexually exploitative guys. One who seemed plausible. And I have to admit, my, even in the revised version, though, so that original version of Father Foley, you know, the Father Foley quote, you know, the, the priest who hugged my grandmother and heard my childhood confessions was lying naked beside me. He's stout. He's 60. You're what? 24. I mean. I would have been, I think, I, I don't know, it was maybe was like 20 or 21 then. I would have to go back. Yeah. I mean, I talk about how you, you know, this, uh, yeah, well, I think maybe we want a little bit more of the arc of the story because when, yeah, we, yeah. Boom. when when we say you were when you say you were abused, I think you might want to clarify that it wasn't a priest, you know, who was your initial abuser. Oh, I, no, I mean my the, the first sexual abuser I had was my pediatrician, and it was all under the guise of um, medical visits, and um, it was very confusing and. I don't want to give away too much because that's in the book. And, um, but yeah, it, I, I had afterwards, um, when I realized that I was being sexually abused and I was, you know, so when I was 14 and 15 and yeah, it's possible for a 14 and 15 year old to not know about the true mechanics of sex. I, I really, I had no idea what this guy was doing to me and I was in denial that this was something. But yeah, so I kind of separated that experience. It was like it had always happened to, to, to me, but it happened to this other me. And I always said that it didn't really affect this me and I had to be a perfectionist and get straight A's and get the leads and make all state choir. You know, I became a perfectionist to try to escape that. And then when that started falling apart in college um, and the acting training was breaking down my emotional boundaries that was keeping that separate and it was all starting to come together it was all at that point you know i had this first kind of breakdown moment um that i kind of realized yeah i think god does still love me in the midst of all this and that's what started me on the turn back towards the church which led to me feeling this call um go 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 oh, I yeah Jumping off that, you know, um, finding out that, that you were abused when you were a kid, um, I know I'm making jokes about all the dicks, but, but like, can you talk a little bit about like why there is so much sex and do you tie it to that happening to you in your childhood and like that's the way you understood connection or, or love? Um, why there's so much sex in the priesthood or the seminary? No, in the book. Like, why is there, is there so much sex? Well, I can tell you this much. Since um, leaving, coming out of the closet, and starting to reconnect with other guys who have left, there was a lot more sex going on at St. Mary's Seminary than I knew. <laughs> I mean, a lot. I, I, I can't believe, after everything I wrote and everything that I've been through in my life, I still feel naive. I still feel naive when I hear their stories. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need we need to write more books. I mean, this is crazy that all this stuff was going on. So I just assume it was also going on at Loris College. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not like people are different. If you're celibate, you're still a sexual person. And I think that that's one thing that this book does that I, I don't know that I ever read another book that was as honest that I wanted to write a really honest 
spiritual like book that showed how someone who is a very loving, passionate, sexual person, and sexuality is your relationality too. It's not just genitality. I mean, that's one of the things we learned about. And then we tried to separate. And how do you be celibate? How do you not realize this need for communion and an incarnate love in your life with other people if you're not asexual? And I'm definitely not asexual. And I don't think many of the guys were really asexual. I mean, most of the guys were gay in seminary. I mean, it was like, like one of the lines on Pat's, Pat said this in, back in seminary, the, the character Pat in the books, you know, says, um, we're gay until proven straight, we're seminarians. I mean, it's like 80% probably of the guys were gay. So I think, I don't know if that answered, if I talked around the question. I mean, there's a lot of sex. Because I think there's a lot of sex because, you, like you, I think that was a great answer. Like you said, it was happening all around you. It wasn't happening because of you. Yeah. And I think, like, uh, like I just finished reading Whip Smart from Melissa Phoebos, and she's a dominatrix, and she said the majority of her clients were Hasidic Jews. And um, you know, I've been watching Rami on uh, was it Netflix or Hulu, and it's like you know this connection between Muslim men and the Muslim religion and porn, and it's like it's just an it, like when you're tamping something down, the natural response is is it's going to blow, pun yeah. intended. Tom, so, could you also true. talk a little bit about the, the conflation of religious ecstasy, the ecstasy yeah. in prayer? with sexual ecstasy. You had a funny line. You mentioned your friend, Pat. You compared, you know, it was like, you know, Teresa of Avila, Francis of Assisi, and Pat of Baltimore. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's another thing that's very, that does happen in this book is you, we go into this kind of exploration of, of mysticism as well at one point, and um, really what, when you, at least in my experience, in other, in other people who I was close to in seminaries experience, I mean, you have to channel that energy somewhere, that sexual energy. And if you're celibate, you're supposed to, you're supposed to have your whole self and your whole being dedicated to God and be giving yourself to God. So I was channeling all of that sexual energy into my prayer and into God. And so you're not masturbating, you're not having sex, you're in the prime of your sexual life, um, some interesting physiological things can start to happen when you're channeling your sexual energy into God and into your prayer. And you start having mystical, like I, I'm guessing, I don't have any clue. I, I was not, I can't go back and be Teresa of Avila, um, but maybe, you know, you look at the picture and I describe it on um, Bernini's Teresa yeah. of Avila sculpture and I've been able to see Teresa it Teresa in ecstasy. Yeah, Teresa in ecstasy. And I mean, it looks like she's having an orgasm. And it, it, it I mean, that's, there's no other thing to describe for me that, that, yeah, the prayer and the sexual energy started mixing together and it gets, you, you get, it, it's, it seems so bizarre now to me, but it really, it makes sense. I was trying to make my life work within that system I'm a lover and a truth seeker, and I was gonna do whatever I could and try whatever I could to make myself psychologically as healthy as I could be by that point in the book. But and it seems, it's so odd. For, I mean, I think one of your colleagues describes celibacy as porcupine squeezing together for warmth. Yes. <laughs> I liked that. Yeah, that was my moral theology teacher. And she, How apt. Yeah, and social justice teacher. She, yeah, that, and it was a, and a, a woman that said that to us in class. And, and that's a theme through one of my favorite chapters, the spiritual exercises chapter. Um, and yeah, it, it's, we would, we would, it was the intimacy. It was weird because we all wanted intimacy. We all wanted friends and um, we all wanted to be close and be loved. But at the same time, we are afraid to get too close to one another because we're also all in the closet and we're not telling each other, well, at least at this point, I was not telling people I was gay and my friends weren't telling me they were gay. And so we would just basically like porcupines, yeah, we would try to huddle together for warmth and just quill each other and then you'd back away. And it was a really, it was a difficult, it was a difficult time. 
for all of us. As you can see in those chapters, I mean, these are all men that I just loved that I was in school with and you can see how horrible it was. And, and those of us who have left have continued to struggle um, through the years and the decades with the psychological repercussions of what we went through. I mean, one of our friends did not survive. He drank himself to death. So, I mean, it's, it, it, it was really damaging to us. Well, speaking of drinking, maybe you can talk about that first party with, you know, potential recruits for the seminary. Because when I read that, I guess it was a Catholic thing, but to me, it looked like a, you know, Fire Island tea dance. Yeah, so there is a lot of alcohol in the priesthood and the seminary, a lot. Um, I did not drink much, you know, growing up. Um, Italian family, we had wine with meals and my dad would give us these little like cordial glasses with wine and we'd get a few sips and he would taught us to drink in moderation that way. It was a celebratory family thing. And then I got to college and I became very scrupulous. And so I wasn't gonna drink and I wasn't gonna have sex, even though I, well, obviously I was not having vaginal sex, but- I was gonna say, I don't think you were so uh, good with that uh, yeah. resolution. Yeah. Um, college. <laughs> so anyhow, wait, what were, oh, the, the party. So what I was setting it up for was, so by the well, time- it had a certain wholesomeness compared with Father Foley, and I hope you'll get to Father Foley, but yeah. let's go to the party. Yeah, so Great the first- Father Foley. Yeah, all those handsome young men, and that, you know, tell us about the party. Yeah, so this is right when I'm like, about three months into this discernment of being coming a priest and thinking I'm called. And I get invited to go to the director's seminarian's Christmas party, um, Father Hunter in the book, and um, who would eventually be my, my last pastor. So there's a lot of interesting introductions and themes starting off there. So I get to this house and I, I, um, I go with Father Scott, who is my pastor at the church. And he doesn't drink, his dad's a covered alcoholic. I mean, I think I'm going to this party where we're all going to be like talking about God and praying and scripture. And it's going to be this wonderful thing. We walk into this Christmas party and Father Hunter takes me into the, into the dining room and the table is covered with more bottles of alcohol than I have seen anywhere except for behind the bar at my family's restaurant and asked me what I want to drink. And I want to fit in. I want to, I want to look right. It's like, it, I was 20. My, my um, birthday was in March. So this was at Christmas time. And I was like, oh my gosh, um, what am I going to drink? I'm not even 21. What do I do? And so I was like, well, what would my mom drink? Because I'm like, I didn't know I won't like what my dad would drink. So I'm like, oh, fuzzy navel. So I'm like a fuzzy navel. And he guffawed. I mean, it was just, it's like, whoa. Yeah. And so anyhow, this party that just- could be a segue to Father Foley. Well, wait, I think you wanted me to get to the part where it was just crazy. I mean, people were, I, I, I've always had a potty mouth, right? Being a theater major and, um, and go, growing up in Catholic school is where I learned to swear. Um, I was swearing up a storm by the time I was in fourth grade and sixth grade. We used to have swearing contests behind the church. <laughs> Us kids to see who could think of the most swear words. Um, but um, yeah, there, there was this guy talking about um, all of his sexual escapades with women and bragging and degrading women. And I, 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 it, was, it was quite an eye opener for me to see the drinking and the, and the talk that was going on. I was shocked and I was trying to fit in and I was intimidated. I was afraid to drink. I, I did not like drinking back then because I thought that people would be able to tell I was gay if I got drunk. I was trying, it's the whole passing thing that Amanda had brought up um, on her social media getting ready for this. I mean, we were all trying to pass as straight as well in the midst of all this. I mean, it was, it was interesting. I was wondering too, like, so I, as I said this on Facebook earlier today, but like I'm reading Janet Mock's uh, memoir and I'm listening to uh, The Vanishing Half and I'm watching Pose. Oh my God, I just finished Pose. If you have not watched the show, it is fucking incredible. But it's it like every situation, it, like passing is such a theme. It's like, 
you know, passing as a woman, like the realness of being a woman and like, you don't want to get discovered. And, and, and really it's like passing as heteronormative, like normal. And like, I understand that, you know, I got lucky with the blonde hair and the blue eyes. I was able to hide all my crazy, like behind like the normal facade to some extent. And I wondered, how, like, I want you to talk about that and like how that is a theme in your work. But also I wonder if, that was part of you um, wanting to become a priest because here was a way, like you knew you were gay, but here was a way that you could be normal. Yeah, I mean, you grew up Catholic and you're gay in a church that says you're intrinsically disordered. Right. And, that, and that if you're going to have, a, you can't have sex as a gay person because you're not open to life according to the church. It's not a life giving act, you know, that, because there's not a sperm fertilizing an egg and in the Catholic teaching that's the only sex that's allowed is trying to make a baby and mm -hmm. so if you um I mean there's more to it than all of that but that's the gist of it enough for now um so yeah it doesn't if you're gay you're an outcast in the Catholic church but if you become a priest you're a saint I mean you're you're a leader you're a hero and so it makes sense for gay kids to want to be a priest and also following Vatican II, the, the way priests, the type of people needed to be priests changed. I mean, you suddenly, they wanted priests that were preachers and, and singers and charismatic and liturgical and counselors, pastoral counselors. You were no longer the father knows best, the administrative priest, the, the strong priest that just took care of everything and managed everything. Now you had to be pastoral and interact with people and counsel people. And so gay men are, you know, have these traits where they're like stereotypically more empathetic and more creative and musical and theatrical. So all of those traits really fit really well with the post-Vatican II priest. So you see people like you and you think, oh, that makes sense for me, you know? And I met this Father Scott, it was like, holy cow, I can preach, I can sing, I can minister to people, I can help people find peace in their lives. And it just, it's where you fit. And then there's the passing thing though. Then you have to, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be straight, you gotta be celibate. And there's, this, this just hit me. You also have to be pious and holy. And so there's this whole, idea of guys trying to pass in the seminary as being holy and very like so they put on the trappings of piety and holiness and i never thought of it that way before but it is a type of passing to show that you are i guess yeah that you are celibate you are a priest and so you know you get the guys who start wearing the berettas or the old style cassocks and and um that are really into adoration of the blessed sacrament or say the rosary, or they get their things that really show how they are into the trappings of the church and are passing. And That's sometimes those bit. people are just as sexually as active as anyone else, you know? That seems a little bit like the Pharisees drawing attention to their, you know, the theatricality of their faith as opposed to having the actual, you know, Christian faith, which is supposed to be an interior non-demonstrative thing. Yeah. I recall this from my Catholic past yeah. and my years from pa of passing. <laughs> and uh, actually I contributed to, uh, to an, you know, as you know, to an anthology edited by um, Lisa Page and Brando Skyhorse called We Wear the Mask, 16 Stories of Passing in America. Um, oh, I want to read that out. I don't. I you mean I, I didn't? I, I didn't. I inflict that upon you at some point. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. I this was was this like maybe eight years ago? No, this was, would have been in 2017. 2017. Yeah, when I was um, I I was teaching at Yale with Lisa, and it was the summer of Rachel Dolezal, and Lisa is biracial, and um, she, you know, we didn't have a moment's peace. I was sharing a suite with her and, you know, every 15 minutes, some reporter would call to weigh in on racial identity. And out of it came this essay. Um, you know, my essay was about passing. I, the essay is called Among the Heterosexuals about, um, it's a chipper little thing 
about the murder of my first lover when she was 23 and I was 24. And um, then my 17 year marriage. Um, I did read that. But I, yeah, I was going to say it's a cheery little artifact. Um, but yeah. yes, I'm familiar with the notion of passing. And I think you articulate the, the pressures so well in your book, Tom. Yeah. But let's get back to Father Foley. Oh man, why are you stuck on that? Because it was the most propellant thing I've ever read, and I'm shocked. That it, you know, I'm even sure even if, even if it's current, even in its current abridged iteration, it seems like the most astonishing betrayal of trust, and exactly an emblem of the sort of thing that Spotlight exposed. Yeah. Well, um, huh. That you know the trusted I mean, family to priest. To understand how that developed and happened, I mean, there you have to understand. You have to look at where um, my interactions with Father Scott were at that point. I mean, there was a lot of sexual tension between the two of us, and he was vacillating back and forth. You know, ambivalent. One minute hugging me, the next minute yelling at me and telling me to go home and i mean it was a very confusing time for me and i was what about a year or so into it's just about a year into my heavy discernment of the priesthood and um and i really wanted role models you know i the role the, my the, one thing that got cut a lot of a lot of stuff maybe this will a lot of stuff got cut from the first part of the book um, sorry, Amanda. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of stuff got cut from the first part of the book. It, it was, the book was originally like 164, 168,000 words, and now it's just under 110. So it's about 35% of the book was cut, and most of it was cut from the first two sections. Um, there were some painful cuts from later as well, but you missed the stuff in the book about my childhood parish and the parishes of Clinton, Iowa. They were all infighting. There's a whole sordid history in Clinton about um, American Protective Association, which was one of the precursors to the Ku Klux Klan forming in the 19th century in Clinton. So I never really, all that to say, I didn't have any priests that I really identified with from my hometown, except for Father Foley. And he had left, you know, when I was, he got transferred. Um, and then, um, when I was in high school, so I wrote him a letter saying, you know, Hey, I'm thinking of being a priest and you're the priest from my hometown that had the most positive influence on me. And I went to meet him and he was the first priest who was honest with me and talked to me about how celibacy worked for him. I mean, at the level of genitality and, and sexuality, nobody else had ever done that. So, I mean, that was incredible for me to hear from somebody how it actually worked, you know? You need to have a friend you can get back rubs with, you need to, I mean, it, it, and I was young and vulnerable and, and lonely and confused by the feelings with Father Scott that, I mean, I was, I was, I mean, I was right there. I was ready to be taken, you know? So I hope that answers the question a little bit. I don't know if that's what you want. Yeah, I was going to say, we don't want to give away the store. Maybe yeah. is it time to take some questions, Amanda? Yeah, let's actually, um, let's jump off uh, that last that last comment, actually, that you made. We have a question from Crystal. She said, I know this is a loaded question, but what is your view of the Catholic Church now? Besides the fact that there are still things being covered up, people, both male and female in formation being abused, and there is total silence and protection of those committing the crimes. How um, do you about it now? Do you just want to wash your hands of it, or are you still engaged in the church? Um, it's impossible to not be engaged with the church. They won't let us go. I mean, the church legislates against LGBTQ people. It still legislates against women. I mean, you leave the church, but then they come after you at the ballot box. So it's like you can't escape. So um, 
Wait, what was the main question again, Amanda, at the very beginning when you said it? Basically, like, knowing that things are still going on, like, do you want justice? Like, what is your thought about Catholicism? I, I believe in the separation of church and state. So I wish, for one thing, they just leave us alone at the ballot box, for one thing. Um, I can't, I tried to change the institution. I, I challenged it. I thought I could change it. That was part of the control, which is another thing that's a theme through the book is how it's, it's like, a, it's a cult. I mean, you're brought into this cult and you're trained to think a certain way that keeps you in control and under their control. And so I, I really wish that the church would give people the freedom that they teach, which is that it's, you know, your privacy of conscience and that sort of thing. I don't have a direct relationship with the Catholic Church. I am not Catholic. I left, I mean, at the end of the book, I don't believe this stuff. I'm like questioning this stuff at the time. And um, the next the next book, if there will be one, will be more about my journey out of faith and, um, and finding peace there. So I do wish that the church would um, change. I wish that they would stop covering up sex abuse. Um, the reason this book finally got published is because a year ago in January, Cardinal McCarrick in Washington, D.C. was um, exposed for abusing seminarians the same way that I was sexually exploited and abused as a seminarian. And suddenly stories like mine were on the front page of the New York Times and in Rolling Stone. And I had tried selling this book for years before that. I mean, since 2012, I was trying to sell the book and suddenly in 29 and getting no, 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 even with Spotlight, I got no, now it's passe. Before Spotlight, it was too risky. It was, they didn't know how to market it, which meant it's too gay. And they didn't know what to do with all this sex and the mysticism and all of that. And the thing is, is that this abuse is still going on. So I'm not gonna stop speaking out. Um, and I do hope that those Catholics who are still in the church and pushing for change, I hope that in this movement that's going on right now in our country, that they will start speaking out as well and forcing these issues within the Catholic church, these things that need to be changed and made better because the sexual abuse is still happening. People say it is it, but it is. You see it in the paper. Every once in a while, there's another exposure of a bishop covering things up since 2002. And it's just, it's still going on. So, so the next question, I, I'm going to um, put one of my questions and the Wico's question also together. When I finished this book, I, you know, I read it as soon as I got it. I got it early. Um, and you and I have talked about it and I've been sober now for seven or eight years and in the program. And I had this like, uh, aha moment where I was like, both of us were searching for God. We just had very different, very flawed roadmaps, you know, um, and kind of the question is, do you identify with any religion or have any spiritual practices today? Yeah. Um, well, I am definitely an atheist. I'm a nun right now. I don't, I don't believe any of that. I, I do believe in um, humanity and in human beings. I'm a very spiritual person still. I mean, you will find me outside barefoot walking on the grass still, just like I would between my classes. You will find me um, talking to the trees and you will find me singing and out in the yard and out in nature. I mean, nature is a huge part of my um, Zen, my spirituality, but um, no, I, in my life, I came to a place where um, not believing was a freeing experience for me, and I evolved in a place to where um, I found greater peace without religion or God in my life. I'm a better person. I'm happier. Um, I'm just as generous and as loving as I was before. I, I don't I don't, and I'm actually, life has much more meaning to me now because if this is the only life we have and scientifically, rationally, that's all we can know is that we have this life. We don't know what happens after we die. Then why wouldn't I want 
to live it as well as I could? Why wouldn't I want to speak the truth? Why wouldn't I want to try to make things better for as many people on this planet as possible so that their lives are less miserable than so many people's lives are now? I mean, for me, it's like the fundamental reality is we have this one life. Let's make it as good as we can for as many people as possible and be as good as we can to people. And so that all had more urgency to it for me without an afterlife. So I hope that there's a lot more to all of that, but that's basically I've definitely it. seen, I've been witness to the, um, the nature and the walking around outside barefoot and the talking to the trees. So I can definitely vouch for all of that being true. Um, Lisa says, one thing I loved about the book was how uncomfortable Tom's neediness made me feel. And I will second that because there were certain situations where I had to put the book down and walk away because my heart was breaking for you. She says, I wanted to tell baby Tom, trust yourself, trust your voice, trust your worthiness. But I knew, but I know your neediness grew from terrible abuse. How did you decide to be so raw and honest about exposing your neediness to the readers? Well, I wanted, in, when I wrote this book, um, and MG worked really hard with me on this in the, in the first draft, and, and I wanted to remove anything that, that um, projected my current mindset back onto the time period. I wanted to recreate it as closely as I could to what it was that I was experiencing in the time of the book. And um, thankfully, I journaled like crazy. I was a writer before I knew I was a writer. I mean, I did those spiritual journaling, as you see it when you read the book, as a part of my spiritual practice. So I had journals from all of these years, except for the first section of the book where I burned the journals at the end of the section of the book. But I did pull out enough of my things that I that I wanted to keep that weren't that wouldn't um, that wouldn't have got me, you know, that I wasn't afraid they didn't out me, you know. But so I was able to go back and use letters and other things and piece those things together. But having the journals allowed me to really see back into the neediness and to just be completely honest because some of those some of the some of the sections in the book they follow the same beats that my journal writings would have been from that time period you know it's rewritten to be uh more more um literary and to work better but it's it's very similar to the way my thought process was working then and i do have a very active thought process in my head. My brain's always going and always processing. So I think that's kind of reflected in some of the narrative as well. So I, I, I hope that answers Lisa's question. But okay. I wanted, I didn't, I didn't want, I did I wanted people to make up their own mind about me, about these people that, because I wanted them to be as surprised as I was when I realized I'd been being abused. Right. Because I didn't know that I was being abused when I was being abused. And that's, that's something that I don't think people that aren't survivors maybe understand is that some people do know that they're being abused when they're being abused. Some of us don't. And I, I didn't for a lot of the time, no. Especially with, with, well, with the doctor, but again, with Bob, these other priests, you know, I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. Gaslighting, I mean, mind games, all the sorts of things that happen. It, it's there to keep you from realizing it. I think that goes back to what I was saying about you, you know, believing people when they tell you something. I think like a real good, like a, the, the art of a, of a good memoir is to, you're not trying to create, you're not creating like a false front. You're trying to let people see into the deepest, darkest parts of you. And I think you did that so well in this in this book and anyone who has been um, like betrayed by someone they love because you love these people and 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 it's so obvious in their actions that they're using you like you're a tool for their their uh, satisfaction I guess I don't know one thing I know MG is trying to talk but just yeah. one quick thing um, one thing if you don't know what it's like to be Catholic um, and be raised Catholic I mean it's a very it's, it's 
all these images of the cross in the book. I mean, th there's one line in the book as I was rereading it this weekend, and I'm paraphrasing here, but at one point, Father Dixon, you know, towards the end of the book, as I'm just like suffering and falling apart, says, says to me like, well, the question is, like, how much pain can you endure for God's will? or something of that nature. And I mean, that's really at the heart of a lot of Catholic spirituality and it's pain for God, you know? I mean, it's so, yeah, I was suffering a lot of pain, but it was supposed to be redemptive. That's the teaching, it's redemptive. So MG, what were you, I thought you were trying to say something. I was gonna say you're, you're a great fan. I noticed uh, Bob Ladendorf has a question that you kind of answered and it's, it's a little more focused though. Um, he says, he asked this question yesterday during the AFI documentary on the sexual abuse of gymnasts. And he's wondering, you know, I have to read off the screen and he's wondering, and I have to, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, with the exposés of sexual abuse in sports, universities and schools and the Catholic church, will we be seeing less sexual abuse in these institutions? Or is that too optimistic? I mean, does fear of exposure possibly reduce the incidence of um, sexual abuse? I don't, I don't, I mean, I hope, I mean, I hope that these, that they're, that they're changing things in these systems enough to protect these. I mean, the, you know, in the vulnerable. gymnastics but, world, it's pretty gruesome. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. I think that, so it's similar to what's going on today with police abuse. Um, there's just this tsunami of evidence and all these cases that are just flooding the media right now. And that's exactly what it was like in 2002. I mean, every paper, front page, every paper on every Sunday was another bishop, another bishop covering it up, another priest, another story. And another diocese, and it was just, and then another country that it was being exposed in, very similar to the, the, the racial violence and, that you're seeing against black people by police today. And it was disorienting and scary. And the reason I'm bringing that up, there are a lot of similarities, but your question about will the institutions change is that I think that the reason you get sexual abusers as coaches, as priests, as youth ministers, as, um, as um, the Boy Scouts, is because these are jobs that, they're, that a lot of really, really good people do, and they're there to help people, but they're jobs that also provide people access to children and power over children or power over their college athletes or their seminarians. And so you're gonna get predators who wanna exploit that. There are always gonna be those people who exploit it. And so I think that there will always be a level of abuse in those fields because pedophiles and ephebophiles are gonna gravitate to that so they can pass and blend in as a good person while they're doing this. And it's similar like with the protect and serve of the police, you know? There's gonna be racists and people who wanna take out their anger and you know, do horrible things to people of color that are gonna be drawn to become cops because that's a situation where they're able to exploit and do what their dark thing is. And so I, I think that, yeah, I think that's always gonna be there, Bob. I hope that, I hope that people are changing these systems. I, I think the universities hopefully will figure this out much better than the church has. And um, the scouts as well, and some of these others were continued. Good question. You want me to read? Cause it, cause yeah, I have one, Amanda. <laughs> uh, Leonard wants you to tell us about your involvement with the research project that led to the founding of the clergy project. Oh, wow. Um, good question, Leonard. Um, I'm going to have to like scrape my memory here. So it was back when I lived in Los Angeles. Um, I think I'm trying to remember how this happened. I must have been blogging at the time. And um, Linda Lascola, I asked, who is a researcher and runs the Rational Doubt blog, and Dan Barker from Freedom from Religion Foundation. Um, I was a member there and I was reading their stuff. Somehow 
they learned about me and Linda had this book that she was working on research about um, people who had lost their faith who were still ministers. And so I'm Tony in her book and Linda, forgive me, I can't remember off the top of my head, the title of your book right now. Um, and so I, Linda interviewed me and, and then they were like, we're working on this other thing called the Clergy Project, which was a forum online for uh, priest ministers of all nuns, whatever, of all different de religions and denominations who no longer believe. And some of these people are still ministers and others have left. Some are in active ministries and many of us have left. And so it was a support network. And back in um, 20, I think it was 2011 is when they founded it. And I was, I was one of the first members of it. Um, and I was active that first few years. Then I kind of, I got to the point where I had to step away. You know, I really did as the book was not selling and it's a hard time. And I really just had to kind of, I needed to move on for a while and really just be away from all the, the church stuff. I had to heal and be myself outside of this, but I've been getting back on there a little bit more in the last month. And I see now, and I've, I've been helping friends of mine that, that have left religion or left seminary as well. And that's woken me back up to this whole, the whole need to be there for people because that are in that process, because it's, it's a really dark place to be when you no longer have faith and your job is dependent upon that and your entire life <laughs> and all your studies and all your certifications and all of your professional, um, momentum is all gone because you no longer have your religion. I mean, it's a huge loss. You lose everything. You don't just lose your job. You lose your family. You lose your job. You lose your community. You lose your friends. You lose your security. I mean, you lose everything when you leave ministry and don't have just your like, faith. Just like leaving a cult. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Um, jumping, Roger from Seattle wants to know, he loved your book, wants to know what happened, do you know what happened to Fathers Hunter and Scott Bell, classmates of Dell and Patrick? Okay, um, let's- That's from Baltimore. Abdel is watching tonight. Hey, Abdel. Abdel, Abdel is like my sister and my brother and my, Abdel and I are, are, we've been through the ringer together and, um, so Abdel is doing well. Abdel is a principal and a leader in a school, in a whole school district, and he is changing lives for children and their families and the district, and he's incredible. Um, Pat is still a priest. Um, and um, the, other, the other two, um, yeah, they're still priests. Um, I, I heard that Hunter, um, had to retire early for health reasons. I'm just gonna say, I mean, you know, you read that part of the book, probably wouldn't be surprised by that. And um, yeah, Father Scott is still a priest and last I heard is in a cluster of parishes in Iowa. You want me so. to some questions? Yeah, but I think that last one is pretty good. Uh, the one that the, the one that is identified with the galaxy with under the stealth name of Galaxy S eight. Oh. Of all the reactions, you know, you've received to the book since its publication, and congratulations on that. What surprised you the most? Hmm. A good one. What surprised me the most? Oh man. What has surprised me the most is, this is gonna sound, I don't know. Amanda, I think will understand this because we talked about this about a month ago. What has surprised me the most is hearing people's reactions and their shock to what I went through. And their like reaction is, oh my gosh, I can't believe all this stuff happened. How did, I'm so sorry and this is, and it, so what, what happened is their reactions had created a reaction in me, which was coming back and looking at it all these years later is, 
that really was really was messed up and and like reading it this weekend i was like wow i really believe this stuff and 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 so my reaction is just really one of um gratitude that i that i escaped um and that i had the strength to escape and the react the the reaction that Amanda and I both had, because I had just been reading her book, was, "How did we end up as how do we how do we end up as normal as we did after all of this?" I mean, a not therapy. that we're both of us a lot of therapy. Yeah. So that was kind of the big shock for me was seeing other people's pain as they read it and their reactions or their anger and being like, "Yeah, this was my story, and it never seemed all that weird to me." now going back to it all these years later it's like yeah this was pretty crazy yeah that's that's kind of the, the and I, I guess i've been surprised too by some people that have contacted me you know that i haven't heard from in a long time and and um it's always good to hear from people and especially people who are doing really well and who have grown and escaped and from the own cycles of violence in their life well, I think that, that uh, Karen, damn you, Karen, would like us to wrap it up. Yeah. Do you have any burning desires to say anything before, before that well, happens? Should we, should we take another question or two? Or should we, do we have any questions that need to be answered that you think are we, good? Or? So we, we can take one last one. And um, MG, why don't you pick it? Um, well, I'd like to ask my own. Sorry, oh, but folks. that's not a good idea. <laughs> I'll just, um, oh, I noticed Abdel is saying hi. That's yeah, a, like, hey. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good thing. I was sort of hoping you'd talk a little bit about the pull-down menus on Microsoft Explorer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I was going to do a little reading, but I won't do it from there. But yeah, one of the ways that I was trying, yeah, you had to learn to sidestep your sexuality um, to, to, you didn't want to repress it. So you learned to sidestep it. Now, I don't know if there's much difference there, but um, so this counselor, my 10th, you know, the counselor number 10 in the book, because they just are numbers, because I went through so many of them, um, who was a very profound influence on my life. And if you're out there, thank you. Um, there were some shortcomings, obviously, in the homophobia of the church that limited Ten's ability to truly counsel me to good health. But Ten was the person who helped me to be able to accept that I was gay and that that was a gift, that that was not, a, that that did not make me a, like a bad person and, and helped me work on my internalized homophobia. But one of the things that Ten taught me that we did to try to help me to stop masturbating because you know you can't masturbate if you're a priest if you're really celibate that includes no masturbation so we developed this method of like i developed this internet explorer list of favorites like in my head so that if i woke up in the middle of the night or if i was stressed and we figured out what times of the year i masturbated more and so i pictured this internet explorer in my head and the drop down menu of all the different items you know that I could do instead, like, you know, go for a walk, um, go pray in the chapel, call a friend, you know, all these things. And so there's this whole chapter where um, it, it, I get into this, there's a, towards the end of the book, you get more into this pattern of like counseling appointment scene, counseling appointment scene. So you're seeing the formation, which is an interesting word too, that's what they call seminary formation, when they form you to be a priest. And so you're kind of seeing that formation process take place in the book. And so throughout that chapter, you see me trying to use these different drop down things from the menu and failing miserably. And at the same time, you're seeing some of my close friends um, who are in the seminary. And, and, you know, it was hard to write that part of the book. There were so many people that had to combine people and timelines to, to make it into a, a, a an understandable number of characters in the seminary, but you really see through my eyes too, what a struggle they're having with the same thing. And with most of us being in the closet, you know? I mean, if, if you read the book, I think Mick is the only straight guy in our friends. 
And Mick, if you're out there listening, I mean, he's as clear as me. He's straight, but he's as goofy as me. You know, he, he, he fit in with us and was a great guy. I love him. So. I feel like coming off quarantine, we can all understand the struggle to not masturbate a lot because we're all stuck in the house and like, what the fuck else are you supposed to do? Ah! <laughs> oh my God. Is that how we're going to end the night? <laughs> I'm fine with that. I don't know. Um, we can do one or two more, Karen says. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, let's do one or two more. Um, Courtney wait, while you're looking, wait, while you're looking for one or two more, let me just say my thank yous in case people need to go. Because okay. I, have an, I, have an, I have an announcement to make. So I have two more events coming up. This is exciting. So a week from tomorrow on the 30th, um, I'm going to do another reading and interview through Skylight Books in Los Angeles. And another one of my teachers and mentors from USC that worked with MG there, Janet Fitch, Fitch. is going to join me. And Janet is the author of um, Chimes of the Lost Cathedral that just came out. And um, she also wrote White Oleander and Paint It Black. And Paint It Black is one of my favorite ones. So um, please join me and Janet Fitch a week from tomorrow. And also that day at 105 on Sirius XM, I'm gonna be interviewed on the Michelangelo Signorelli show. So that's very exciting too. Um, and I just wanna, we'll take a couple more questions, but I wanna thank Prairie Lights in Iowa City. Um, thank you for letting me tell this story to your audience and to get word out in Iowa. Um, I, I had planned to be back in Iowa. I had another reading at Beaverdale Books in Des Moines as well. It got canceled. With, and a, and a, there was a bookstore in Des Moines, or a Davenport. So I'll get back to Iowa for a reading after the pandemic is over. When so there's a vaccine. Much. Yeah. And um, thank you to um, everybody at University of Iowa Press. Um, thanks for taking a chance on me and this story and for all the support you've given me. And of course, thanks to Amanda and MG and all of you for watching and reading. So let's take a few more questions. Okay, we're gonna to go to Courtney Baker. Hi, longtime fan here. Do you think that stories like yours regarding your childhood abuse by your pediatrician will encourage parents to be more honest about how children mature sexually? I know that I started to talk with my kids in elementary school long before they would be in an exam room by themselves. I hope so. Um, I do hope so, Courtney. You guys, Courtney is one of my oldest friends. I mean, we've known each other since we were in dance classes as a little kid, and she was in the Catholic school, went to the same middle school, high school, and we were at UNI together as well. So um, I hope so, Courtney. I hope that people will realize that if they read this book, that yeah, you need to start talking to your children pretty young, and don't leave your kids alone with the doctor. You know, I don't think that probably happens anymore. Um, and it was kind uh, of I was awesome. kidding. USC is now uh, paying out what yeah. two hundred and fifty million dollars to the victims of a of an errant gynecologist. So um, I think it happens. Oh yeah, no, it does. It sure does. Uh, has there been a response? Larry Esposito wants to know: Has there been a reaction from the church about the book's publication? I don't know, Larry. I do not know. Um, I have not heard, so good question. Okay, here's, here's a good one. Jane Campbell, I like what you said about not knowing when the abuse is happening. It seems to me that it can be an overarching paradigm to other types of abuse. Do you have any thoughts about that? Can you repeat that, please? I couldn't hear it very well. And also, I just realized, I think I know Larry from a long, long, long time ago. So hi, Larry, thanks for watching. <laughs> Uh, the fact that you didn't know that it was abuse when it was happening. And do you think that this is, could be an overarching paradigm to other types of abuse? Like that you're undergoing these things, but not realizing it while it's happening. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's kind of the nature of abuse. I think a really good, I, I don't mean it, I don't mean this in that way, but somebody who is a really skilled perpetrator is going to perpetrate abuse in a way that the person who's being abused questions whether or not they're really being abused. That's part of the control of a perpetrator, I think, is to 
make someone think they're not being abused. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's a, that's a cheery one to end on. Yeah. Well, wait, 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 we can do one more. Yeah, let's um, do a happy one. We'll do a happy one. Hi, Tommy and everyone, this is Abdel. <laughs> that's a happy one. So, I actually, Tom, you had so many funny lines. At one point, you're talking with the character Nick, you know, and 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 after a long conversation, you say, "I felt the need to bill him." I'm surprised you're not a therapist. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I, I when I reread the book, there were a lot of great. Um, I was shocked by some of my lines, and it. it's like, how did I write that? You know, it's that, that whole blank canvas thing is ahead of me again now. And it's like, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do the next one? How are you going to equal this? Because it, it's been so long, this project took so long to get realized. It's like, it's incredible that it's finally out there. And um, I'm just thankful that people are reading it and that people's reaction has generally been very positive and a lot thank you notes and people just saying they can't put it down that they, that they want to just, they just have to keep reading. And some people saying that they've even read it in like one sitting, which I don't, I'm a slow reader. I don't even know how that is possible, but you know, people are much faster readers than I am. So that's, that's all really great. And I mean, my goal in writing it was to just put the truth of my story out there because I believe that the more honest and truthful we are about our stories, the more truth, the more, the more we will live the truth of our lives, you know, and that, and that people in the very strange, weird specifics of my life in this um, book, there are all these universal themes that other people will experience and understand in their lives. And my goal in writing this book was to, again, like being a priest, was to help people. I just hope that maybe someone who is in a similar situation as me or knows that I was back then might read this and it might be enough to wake them up. Or maybe somebody who isn't even a seminarian, but then reads, you know, that whole desire is not an emptiness longing to be filled, but a fullness longing to be in relation. Maybe desire is love trying to happen. Maybe that will change somebody's life the way that did for me. And um, it was just, I, 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 I'm, still a, I'm still in many ways a priest and a prophet and a preacher. And I, 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 had, I had to put my story out there. It was never a question of yes or no. I had to do it and it's finally there. So thanks everyone. Oh, now that's a, that's a clincher. That's a, that is a winning clincher. Well, I don't know, Karen, do you, does Karen want to say anything? Here she is. Thank you so much. This was really lovely to, 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 to listen to and thank you to everyone for, for coming and joining us. Um, we have copies of Confessions of a Gay Priest uh, in stock at Prairie Lights. Um, so, if you give us a call or hop on our website, you can order it. We're doing curbside pickup, uh, local delivery for free, and we're shipping within the continental U.S. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay well in all of this pandemic, everybody, and with everything going on, and keep fighting. Oh, it. right. Get that image. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hang on. I have all my little um, things in there, so... All right, so Karen, do you turn off the people now? How does it work? Yes, so we'll just close it. So thank you guys so much. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you.